Mike. Thank you. Don't give me that choice to leave the meeting. Ever Don't ever do that. Okay. Uh, calling to order the Astro Planning and Zoning uh, Commission meeting for April 8th, 2024 at 7.01 p.m. Uh, Valerie is on. Good to see. Um, so again, meeting call to order. Speeding. As I see it, unless I'm missing something, I see Luther, who did text me, saying he's tied up at something. He might join late, but he's tied up. Uh, I haven't heard from Richard or Tom Hastings at this point. So uh, we'll be seating. Tom's, Tom's on the meeting. He is? Yeah. Do I not see him? I'm here. Oh, there you are, right next to Linda Roy. I'm sorry, Tom. Thank you. Sorry. Mr. Smiling Face. Okay. So we will seat Alex for Luther and Steve Pesh for Richard. Good with that, Valerie? Yes. Okay. Now, looking to the minutes of March 11th, I'm looking for approval of the minutes from our last meeting. Is there a motion? Motion. That's Jerry Dufresne. Is there a second? Second. Tom. Second by Tom Hastings. Any discussion? Changes, clarifications, corrections. Hearing none. Um, all those in favor of approving the minutes from our last meeting, signifying by saying aye. 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 Those aye. Uh, not in agreement, let's say nay. And any abstentions? Abstain, Alex. Alex Estillo will uh, abstain. We'll Thank you, Alex. Okay. I'll abstain also, Jeff. And Jeff Schillinger. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, so that leads us up to our uh, opening up to the public for public comment. Um, we have a number of visitors tonight. I would ask that you keep your comments to three minutes or less. Um, and with that, uh, I'll go to Christina Sebo to start us off. Hi, thank you, Jeff. Um, I have a question uh, about something that was said many, many, many meetings ago. I think Mike D'Amato was going to be running the CLEAR program. I'm wondering if that ever happened and will we use those parameters or those that information in changing regulations? The CLEAR program. And when you say running the program, can I just ask what, what it is you mean by that? By yeah. using their using their information or yes, using, using their group? information, but he was he, he uh, supposedly was going to access the the program and run it and get information from it. Is Mike on? Yes, Mike is on. He probably knows what I mean. <laughs> and if not, we're not going to get that information. Why not? Okay. So we've captured that. I might have set a bad precedence in the past where we go back and forth. Usually public comment is not a question and answer period of going back and forth. And I have, we have responded to questions in the past, but at this point we'll come back with a response for you for what Mike's intentions and the commission's intentions are for the CLEAR program. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Christine. Next up, uh, Margie Roy. Good evening. Hello. I'm Margie Roy, 221 Old Town Road in Ashford, and thank you for giving me this, this opportunity to speak. I would like to inquire about the special permitting process. Over the past year, commission members have often mentioned using the special permit process to regulate development in Ashford. I'm not qualified to evaluate 
Ashford zoning special permit regulations, but I have heard a number of land use professionals and land use attorneys, both pro and anti-development state that the Ashford special permit regulations are insufficient for and shouldn't be relied on so heavily. Other than Commissioner Williams stating many times that there are regulations for making applicants pay for testing and research in the special permitting process, there has been no other discussion by commission members on the strength of the regulations for implementing any of the findings from this testing or research. My questions are, has the commission asked for input from any qualified professionals as to the sufficiency of the Ashford zoning regulations special permitting process? Are they robust enough to direct development in ways that are in the best interest of Ashford? Or are they indeed relatively weak and insufficient, thus opening us up for legal issues? If you haven't already done so, I would urge the commission to ask these questions of the professionals available and share those answers with the citizens of Ashford. Thank you very much for listening and thank you for your work on this commission and go Huskies. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you, Margie. You're welcome. Christine, your hand is still up. Is do you have another? I do. Item. Okay. I have one more um, thing. I sent a letter, but I apparently um, sent it after the agenda was created, which is apparently earlier than it used to be. Um, I would just like to um, show one photo um, in response to the EDC letter. I wonder if I can share screen and do that. Sure, go ahead. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, I'm sorry. Michael, can you allow uh, Mr. Sebo to uh, do so? Yeah, this is Christina yep. Sebo, 91 Perry Hill Road, Ashford. It should be all set. Go right ahead. Okay. So this is, can you see it? Yes, we do. Okay, this is an Amazon warehouse in Plainfield that was built in 19 in 2021. It's still not occupied. Um, supposedly in 2024 in June, it will be occupied. This is 202,000 square feet. So this is just short of our current regulations. I would like you to look at this and see very little cars here. Look at the parking lots. Look at the size of the building. Picture something twice this size, which is what the EDC would like, smack dab in the middle of pristine wetlands. That's all. I'd just like you to kind of picture this. So I can, I can stop sharing now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine. And that was 202 square feet. Yes. Thank you. And that's 202,000. 202,000. 202,000. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> 202, 202K. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's um, And that's in a letter I sent uh, last week. So I guess it'll be in next month's box. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, and I believe um, in previous meetings, we have a statement in there. I mean, there is no set uh, written procedure, but normally close of business on Wednesday is our cutoff for receipt of uh, material for the meeting, for the agenda. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, it's Mark Schnobel. I mean, I believe I have to have my agenda in by the close of business. So... And right. ideal, ideally getting it to us sooner than that is better, but right. I mean, drop right. dead. If it, it, right. If it rolls in at 545, I'm not going to get it in by six o'clock. You know, right, it's... right. Because we're trying to catch the right. town clerk before they go home, but give everyone the opportunity to the last minute to get something in before our 48 hour requirement kicks in. 
Thank you, Mark. Uh, next up, uh, Larry Gag, please share with us. Hi, I apologize. I haven't been um, up to date with what's been going on with planning and zoning or. Um, it's great video. You should watch it. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you know, since um, the um, proposed mega warehouse was withdrawn, but um, I have just, just 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 to correct Larry. I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt you, but there was no mega warehouse. It was a text amendment for changing the regs. Is what we considered. So please go right ahead. Thanks for that correction. Yeah, my um, recollection was. Uh, a little bit um, twisted to what I was hoping. And you are correct. So Mike, I have questions about the survey that was sent out. Was that sent out by planning and zoning? And, yes, it was. Okay. So how are you going to use that data? Specifically, 78% of the respondents um, were against expanding the square footage for that parcel. Um, where does that data come into play in your process? Um, you know, I've been informed that you're entertaining a motion to increase the the square footage um, requirements of that parcel um, extensively. And so how do you use that survey information um, in the process, in that process? Again, this is not a question back and forth. Okay. Or comment. If you have well, other questions, please go right ahead. Okay. So um, what do you do with the question when you get it? We'll yeah. put together a response and we will provide a response with our next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I'm just curious. And, uh, you know, it, with 78% of the respondents not in favor of increasing the building size, um, do the, um, do the, do the town, um, committees represent the people or do they just represent what they think is personally think is best for the town, specifically the economic development commission. And I'm assuming, um, are they the ones who are prom promoting this motion? And um, thanks for entertaining my questions. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Larry. Any other public comment? Seeing no hands, electronically or otherwise. Okay, thank you very much for your input, folks. Um, for those with that had provided us with questions, we will be responding back, whether we respond directly back to you in an email or if we respond at the next meeting, we will have a response for your questions. Thank you. Yeah, Jeff, this is Dick. Um, sorry, I had problems getting onto the site. I just okay. joined the meeting. Okay, Richard. In that case, we will... <laughs> Seat Richard at seven fourteen, and uh, I'm sorry. Was that Valerie? No, no. Oh, oh I'm sorry. So we'll see Richard at seven fourteen, and uh, Alex, I'll move you uh, out of the picture at this point. But please stay with us. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, moving on to bills. Um, Mark or Mike, uh, any bills for us to deal with? I do not, Mark. Nothing's okay. come in. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, moving on to more meteor matters here. Okay, correspondence. Uh, we have a couple of correspondence that were received. Um, they're single letters, uh, not too long in their length so i will read them into the record if that's uh if no one from the commission has an issue with that uh the first one uh was from the conservation commission let me get back to my meeting here okay so i can see any questions or hands um 
So again, to Ashford Planning and Zoning Commission. The Conservation Commission welcomes the opportunity to provide input to the Ashford Planning and Zoning Commission, PZC, as it reviews the regulations for the IID zone. We also appreciate the thoughtful input of the Economic Development Commission on this matter, though we do not agree with their recommendations. The input of citizens during the public hearings about the recent text amendment proposal, as well as the recent survey of Ashford residents, overwhelmingly showed the large-scale development in the IID zone is not something that would be welcome for a variety of reasons, including um, death of the rural character of Ashford, potential pollution of the wetlands, watersheds for the Fenton and Mount Hope rivers, pollution from disturbance of pyrotite bedrock, and disruptive impacts of light, noise, and traffic. The IID is on the fragile, pristine watershed of the Fenton River and supplies some of the cleanest water in the state for Mansfield stores in Willimantic. The watershed for the Mount Hope River is on the other side of the highway, but also in the IID zone. With no public water or sewer lines in the IID, immense buildings, parking lots, large septic systems, and water needs would be very likely would very likely pollute and drain the watershed and, com and compromise nearby residential wells. We must protect the unique and life-giving resource of our, for ourselves and for our neighbors. Um, there's attached uh, maps from the watershed uh, as part of the 2020 uh, Gene Pillow um, report that was provided and is on record, uh, clearly spelling out the potential for negative impacts on this area, particularly for the health of water resources and the entire watershed, forests and wildlife, especially the wild trout brook. The current POCD states that development in the IID zone must provide a benefit to Ashford residents and not impact the environment in negative ways. These goals were soundly embraced by the residents of our town in letters and spoken testimony at last year's public hearings. The survey asked residents to indicate the uses that might be allowed by zoning regulations for the IID zone. Manufacturing was indicated as an inappropriate use by 51% and as an appropriate use by only 29% of the respondents. In contrast, the EDC would like to ensure that allowable uses would include warehouse and distribution functions, use, uses in scale and environmental impact most closely related to manufacturing. Letters and statements at the public hearing were overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly ooh, opposed to the inclusion of these uses. As many residents have noted, the tax benefits to residents would be small, the increased infrastructure would be required to monitor and support a very large facility would eat up any taxes generated after requested tax abatements are applied. The number of lower end jobs created by likely robotized, roboticized facility would be small and the facility would compete with nearby facilities of the same type that already have difficulty finding appropriate skilled workers. The other important issue addressed by residents at both the public hearing and the survey was preferred building size. The survey responses showed that 79% felt the building in the IID zone should be 250,000 square feet or less. 45% wanted smaller, 34% wanted to maintain the current permitted size of, it says 240,000 square feet. I think our break is 250,000. We believe that building size per se is not the appropriate metric to apply to development in this zone. Rather, specifications for allowable development should be based on scientific data about the characteristics of the land and its environs. As in other towns, qualified professionals can be employed to determine the requirements for building in the headwaters of a public water supply, building above pyrotype bedrock, and building on heavily sloped land. We recommend that regulations from other towns for the protection of water resources be reviewed. We encourage the PZC to utilize these and other available tools to craft regulations for Ashford that will allow us to meet the desires and needs of our citizens and give the town the needed planning and legal tools to allow us to grow responsibly. Finally, we thank the members of the PZC for their ongoing and difficult work on these issues, the Ashford Conservation Commission. Um, I am not gonna go through obviously the Eastern Connecticut uh, Conservation District right up from Gene Pillow. It is available um, in our, uh, archives um, and uh, it is also part of the uh, current record uh, for this meeting. So uh, that was one correspondence that we had. And in that um, Eastern Connecticut Conservation District report, there are recommendations at the end also, which kind of boil things down for the multiple pages and really great uh, 
slides that they provide. The next letter uh, is uh, to from March 27, 2024, dear commissioners. We as Ashford citizens welcome the opportunity to provide input to the Ashford Planning and Zoning Commission, PZC, concerning their review of the IID zone regulations. Over the past year, there has been considerable citizen input about the IID. It has been clear that the vast majority of input has been against large scale development in the IID. We, like most of the citizens in town, strongly believe that development there and in other locations as well, has to provide a benefit to Ashford and not have a negative impact on the environment. These are clearly stated goals in the last POCD. We also believe the current regulations are not detailed enough to give the town the needed planning and legal tools to direct development in ways that will best meet Ashford's goals. We ask the PCC to consider the following as it addresses the zoning regulations as pertaining to the IID zone. What are appropriate built one? What are appropriate building specifications for the land in the IID zone? These specifications need to be backed by research into the characteristics of the land and its environs. They cannot be based on special interest factors, what was built in Willington or what the owner would like. They need to be based on the specific qualities and challenges of this area of town. Questions need to be asked of qualified professionals about building in the headwaters of a public water supply, building above pyrotite bedrock, and building on heavily sloped lands. Specifications should cover one, building size, two, building height, and three percent of impervious cover. Number two, what are other consider what other concerns have been voiced and how are they being addressed at our regulate in our regulations, such as light pollution, noise pollution, maintaining rural character, and traffic impacts. Number three, is the special permit process well enough defined in the Ashford zoning regulations to provide legal support for the PZC to implement these or additional specifications? During the various public hearings over the last year, a number of land use professionals, both consultants and attorneys, expressed concerns over the weakness of the special permit provisions in the Ashford regulations. Members of the PZC have regularly stated that the issues of development can be handled by the special permit process. Is the Ashford special permit process robust enough to provide the needed regulation? Number four, what guidelines have the citizens of Ashford communicated? PCC has done a remarkable job of allowing for citizen input and encouraging all citizens to participate. The survey responses clearly showed that 79% felt a building in the IID zone should be 250,000 square feet or less, 45% indicating reduction, 34% to maintain it. And the grandless growth is not a major priority for residents, maintaining the rural character is. We encourage the Ashford PZC to ask detailed questions and get professional input on these matters to craft better regulations to allow Ashford to grow responsibly and to protect our town from those who don't have Ashford's best interests at heart. We thank you for the time you devote to our town and your ongoing careful considerations of these matters. Sincerely, Margie Roy, David Roy, Susan Levitt, John Levitt, Nora Galvin, Joseph Hedrick, and Christina Sebo, all Ashford residents. So I will state that Mike has been receiving a number of emails and correspondence. However, um, obviously these two uh, that we read uh, give uh, some very specific and some very well thought out information. Um, we do not have a hearing in front of us at this time. Obviously we are looking to have discussion, especially at this meeting and ongoing meetings regarding the IID zone. So um, until we have something on the table that requires um, input from the public uh, and gaining information and such, uh, such as a hearing uh, to that end, um, that's when we'll share all of the information. But again, I think these two got uh, a vast majority. If there's something very, very specific um, that Mike feels we should uh, bring to the forefront, obviously he'll, uh, uh, bring that up and we will discuss it at our meeting. But again, for right now, we do not have a hearing to respond to, a hearing to bring in all public comment uh, for that. But I do appreciate the input of uh, these two letters, especially the uh, Ashford uh, Conservation Commission, as well as the Ashford citizens that uh, did provide information. Okay. Just give me a second here. 
We have no public hearing uh, on the uh, docket. So we'll move on to number seven and unfinished business. Uh, and we will start with uh, discussions. And these discussions are kind of open discussion for the commission uh, to get a handle on direction, get a handle on um, uh, information <clears throat> uh, so that we all are dealing with the same information at hand at this point. So the first item is short-term rentals. And I'll just discuss or just mention that uh, five of us attended the uh, Connecticut Federation of Planning and Zoning Agencies uh, annual dinner at the AquaTurf. Uh, I'll save my indication, my um, information or sh information to share uh, basically about the menu itself, not, not just about the menu, um, uh, regarding the information that was uh, both shared um, not only from the presenters, but the uh, people at our table. Uh, we did come in contact with a couple of towns, most notably was Sherman, Connecticut, uh, someplace a little bit smaller than us, but right on Candlewood Lake up in the Danbury, New Milford area. Uh, with uh, Again, there was a very common thread when it came to short-term rentals. But I would, and put people on the spot right now, I would like to go around and get their input from what they gleaned from the uh, attending this conference. And again, at the conference, not only did we uh, sit with uh, other planning and zoners, but we there was a presentation by, um, and give me a second, her name, uh, the uh, land use planner from uh, Preston, Connecticut, and she was moderator, and that was Kathy Wozetcha. And also speaking, uh, the main speaker of the evening was attorney Franklin G. Pillacy, uh, who spoke on, uh, in general, short-term rentals, but also brought forward a uh, uh, case that is now in front of the Supreme Court regarding short-term rentals. Actually, I believe he had just argued it the uh, day before, before the Supreme Court. And we can get into a little bit of that, too, as an anecdote piece. But... Um, I'll start with the first person I see, which is Mark. Would you uh, like to share any thoughts from attending the meeting or anything you gleaned from that? Well, after after the meeting, I did I did go home and I looked up Preston's regulations on short term rentals. And and actually at the meeting, one thing that did come out is that most towns in Connecticut do not have regulations yet for short term rentals. Um, you know, they're still trying to decide how they want to address it and after looking through Preston's um, they're very similar to ours so I suspect that they probably use some of the same sources you know Hartford Boston um, for drafting their regulations um, their theirs are probably a little more lax than Ashford Preston allows um, it, it doesn't limit how often a short-term renter can rent. The only thing it limits is that any single short-term renter can only rent up to a maximum of three weeks. But beyond that, they don't regulate, you know, the use of the rentals. What I did see that Preston does utilize, which we don't utilize, is they have um, an application that has to be filled out and presented to the planning and zoning board that, you know, is four pages in length. Um, there's also a, a fee of $260 annually for the application and the renewal. And I also pulled, because it, it came out, I think, at the meeting about, you know, the ability to tax short-term renters. So I did look that up and there was a Senate bill, uh, 2023 SB-2. 01137, which allows for uh, local towns to tax 2% of the rental fee. Though I don't see that Preston, at least in the regulations that I read, you know, charges that tax. But that is, at least from what, what I read, that is allowed by Connecticut starting in 23, back in 23. But overall, I thought 
you know, listening to the meeting, I thought that Ashford was, you know, in pretty good shape and, and honestly ahead of the curve for most towns in Connecticut who haven't even started to address short-term rentals yet. Okay. Anything else? No, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Nord, I see you next on the list here as I look at it. Okay. Well, the, uh, my impression from attending that meeting was that the first speaker was uh, um, a planning person from Pr Preston, Connecticut. And everything that she said about short-term rentals was negative, uh, had a negative effect on the well-being of the town, the neighbors, and uh, they had nothing but problems with short-term rentals. And they're trying to craft regulations to uh, limit some of these problems. The other speaker was a lawyer and he was not in favor or against uh, short-term rentals. He just presented the legal aspects. And the, the thing that he said was, that stuck in my mind from, from a legal aspect, because you, you know, you want to be fair to, you want to be fair to the landowner as well as, as, uh, keep things, keep things, uh, healthy in the town. And he said, it's not illegal to rent out a home. The question is the duration of the rental. That's, that's where the, uh, problem comes in. And that, that that's where the legislation is looking at that. That hasn't been settled yet. That's all I have. Okay, thank you, thank you, Nord. Uh, Janet. Um, well, I was uh, interested in Preston. Some of the regulations Preston has that I thought we might consider. Um, they, for safety, they require that the well and the septic system be tested, um, and they require the septic system be, to be sized for a multifamily. Um, they ask for guest register, and uh, as Mark said, they have an annual permit. They allow three violations of their regulations, and after the third one, the uh, permits are um, rescinded, and the and the uh, owner can no longer um, do short term rentals. Um, so I thought those might be some things we look at. the The lawyer did say, as as Nord said, that um, homeowners have a right to rent their property, whether it's long term or short term but we can we can regulate um uh how they how they do it that's all i had okay okay thank you and tom yes uh you know mostly what i got out of the meeting was uh only looking at a few towns, I think we're we're in pretty good shape. I, I feel like the problem with, with any town is going to be enforcement because how are you going to, how are you going to keep an eye on what's, what's happening? And, you know, that seems to be the biggest problem where towns don't know how to really enforce it. So uh, the regulations can be in place and we can even improve on those, but my my take was it's very very hard to enforce it. Okay. <clears throat> very good, thank you. Anything else, Tom? Oh, that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, so just a few of my thoughts, and uh, a lot of my peers stole some of my thunder on this, which I really appreciate. So it really means we had consistent uh, thought process, which is great. Um, I do agree with Mark that we're ahead of the curve with against a lot of towns. Um, we actually were behind and ahead of some towns I talked to because I did find out that some groups did actually rescind their sunsetted, their uh, short-term rentals, uh, and just took out allowing short-term rentals and how that's going to go for them in the long run. I don't know, 
I think burying your head in the sand is not the best solution on something like this. So again, I appreciate the fact that we are so um, uh, forward thinking in uh, the efforts, especially with Mark and Janet that worked on this. Uh, uh, and I think uh, uh, Dick Williams also uh, gave some information. Um, the uh, it, it just shows a lot of towns don't know which way to go on this. Um, they are either starting to do something and finding out that it's much more involved. And I think that's what we have also found out. Again, I think uh, our group did a nice job with what they did develop, the information that they took, the sources that they grabbed it from. But I think that we are lax in some areas when it comes to the ability to, as Tom said, enforcement or instead of enforcement, if we can gain compliance uh, before that, um, before it even comes to enforcement of someone doing something wrong, uh, you know, as, as Janet said, you know, they uh, require a number of items. What I'd like to do is I'd like to share just uh, a couple of slides that I put together um, regarding our current kind of, it's kind of an overall discussion, thought provoking, hopefully, of where we are and um, what we found from the effects of other towns. Actually, Mike and I did have a discussion with Ken Slater uh, regarding what went on at the meeting and where we are with this and how we can potentially gain more compliance. Are we within bounds to do this? So uh, can I uh, share yet, Mike? I uh, yep. oh. Should be all set. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. So, um, shrink this down a little. Okay. Very good. Okay, so some of the considerations of short-term rentals um, that have been brought up, uh, and this is just some of the thought-provoking stuff uh, that came out, because uh, there's been questions. Uh, is it even the role of the town to regulate short-term rentals? Um, obviously, we have little or no enforcement or monitoring capacity on a town our size. Again, speaking to other towns, same similar situation. Um, well, actually, Sherman, who we sh sat with, does have a resident state trooper, but that's only as effective as the trooper is available for uh, any type of issues. Uh, and there is no state regulation or guidance on short-term rentals at this point. I mean, um, the court action that was discussed, uh, that was just argued to the Supreme Court had gone back and forth. It's not like it lost at every level and made it to the Supreme Court. It went back and forth between their local zoning board of appeals, uh, ruled one way, a appellate court ruled the other way, and now it's in with the Supreme Court. So, um, and as Nord said, a lot of that has to do with definitions of uh, residency, transient, and uh, for that matter, the uh, definitions of uh, how long uh, is a short-term rental. Um, what we are finding locally uh, is number two, a majority of our issues, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, 90% uh, plus of our problems uh, arising from the Lake Districts uh, and where, where should we were, sorry on my typo, uh, there are Lake Associations in place. Um, if you think of those as HOAs, um, should they be self-regulating at that point? And again, deal with a number of the uh, issues we have that come from, from planning and zoning. Um, again, our current regulations while forward thinking and being in place um, I, I find them to be somewhat inadequate for all of the issues that are coming up and cropping up when it comes to short-term rentals. Um, whereas we have a page and a half approximately, and good words, really good words, trust me. Um, whereas we have a page and a half, as uh, uh, I think Mark pointed out, they have about four pages of regulations in dealing with uh, all the different areas. And another underlying issue that came up quite a bit was using an ordinance or a regulation. Uh, and just to be clear with everyone, if you have an ordinance, an ordinance doesn't come from zoning. An ordinance comes from the legislative body, which would be the uh, 
um, selectman's office and the town meeting. Uh, and an ordinance also versus a regulation, which we are able to provide and develop regulations on our own. With an ordinance, and Mike, again, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, an ordinance would cover all activity, including activity that is already existing. Um, the law would be applicable to that if so uh, worded. Whereas a regulation, um, much of the activity uh, that has already taken place in a conforming or non-conforming basis um, is grandfathered in. Uh, and uh, that's kind of what the case that was brought up by the attorney at this uh, um, meeting that was being argued in front of the Supreme Court has to do with. It's uh, uh, in the New Haven area, New Haven district, um, that this, uh, Basically, they had a what there was a rental property for less than uh, 30 days at a time back in 1994 that was using it as a single family dwelling with definitions of single family and uh, what a single family dwelling is. Um, uh, terms of home and residence were not defined. Then the town in mm -hmm. 2018 amended its zoning regulations and in amending its zoning regulations, um, it's basically saying a single family dwelling may not be used or offered as a short term rental. And that's what brought it to the courts. And again, it went to the uh, local um, zoning board of appeals and uh, uh, was uh, denied against the plaintiff, the homeowner. Uh, so then it was brought to an appellate court and the appellate court uh, overturned that uh, and deemed for the plaintiff that uh, their their issue, the, excuse me, their activity before the 2018 uh, regulations that set in were proper and just and could not be uh, changed due to uh, the reg from 2018. So now it's in the Supreme Court being argued uh, uh, where the appellate court had concluded that short term rentals considered a permissible use uh, under the previous regulations from 1994. That's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, and uh, I think a lot of towns are waiting to hear uh, what comes out of that, if there'll be any type of definitions provided uh, or if it's just going to be in that single case, what its effect is. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to bring up, and again, it has to do, it, it ties in with what Mark said, what Janet said, uh, and what Tom said regarding enforcement. Um, <clears throat> my thought process has to do with if we require compliance up front, uh, we're less likely to run into a problem of uh, nonconformance or noncompliance later on to the regs. So my thought process has to do with uh, expanding the permitting process mm. uh, where, uh, as you can see here, uh, in order to gain compliance up front and implement enforceable requirements for an applicant seeking a first year permit, to establish a short-term rental property, permit application will require uh, inspection by the building department. I mean, they have a responsibility for the uh, safety of the home that someone is staying in, similar to a, you know, a bed and breakfast or a hotel or a uh, uh, motel. Uh, satisfactory inspection by Eastern Highlands Health District for health code requirements and septic and things that uh, Janet mentioned. Uh, this was an interesting one, I thought, too, that this is, again, follows along the lines of what Preston required, uh, satisfactory inspection of the fire marshal for uh, fire prevention requirements. And there are other items here. That's why I have a question mark for D and E. There are other items we could put in here that really make the applicant kind of toe the line. Uh, they, they, they can't just go out and put this out in the market without having, uh, you know, some type of responsibility when it comes to uh, the proper nature of this. Um, then in order to redo and B, in order to renew a short-term rental permit, the applicant needs to provide the following to the planning and zoning commission or the zoning enforcement officer who would determine whether it needs to go to planning and zoning commission in reviewing its application, uh, re-inspection by the departments mentioned above, uh, potentially provide a statement by the ZEO that no formal complaints regarding non-compliance of the applicable zoning regs have been submitted, including any activity if condition or condition that interferes with the owner's abutter's reasonable and lawful use and enjoyment of the property. 
uh, in support of their application, if the applicant may provide written statements from abutters in support of the applications the applicant's management of the rental property. And uh, again, this gets into something that Janet said, provide a guest registry for the previous permit period, including dates, name of renter, and length of stay. Uh, again, just making them toe the line up front, so to speak, as opposed to uh, pay the cash, get the permit, and um, maybe not come back and get the permit too. I know in the Preston uh, regs, it did uh, indicate uh, timeframes. If you were going to resubmit for your permit, um, you had to have it done by a certain time frame. Uh, right now, we do have a, uh, a permitted use uh, for short-term rental that they didn't come back and renew uh, their permit uh, at this point. And that's one of the discussions that uh, Ken, Mike, and I had regarding uh, generating a uh, letter from the zoning office regarding the intent of that uh, applicant, or I should say, permitted short-term renter. So that was just some of the thought process I had. I'll open it up for uh, comment or discussion by the group. Um, and uh, someone's getting fast on the electric uh, hands up here, I think. Is that uh, uh, you, Richard? Or was yes, that a class? Okay, go right ahead. Uh, one of the things that uh, occurred to me is you had this meeting, uh, and <clears throat> I and my family have rented. Excuse me, I'm, I'm fighting off allergies here. Uh, we've rented uh, places along the shore uh, in Lyme, Old Lyme, Saybrook, and two or three places in Rhode Island. And these have been like one week, two week rentals. Uh, several of them were advertised on uh, Airbnb and VRB or something like that. Verbo, uh, yes. Yep. VRBO, yep. And uh, I never recalled anything uh, as being controversial. And about uh, of the neighbors that we rented, where we rented, I would say about 50% of the neighbors were rentals. Uh, were there anyone at this conference from the shore communities? Um, it really didn't give us an opportunity to uh, mingle around and find the different groups like that. What you found was we found a number of lake groups. I mean, you know, Preston has that activity. So does Sherman. Um, I'm trying to think who almost sat with us. Who's who's a group that sat down and then moved on? That is, uh, anyone remember that? Mark or Tom? They were from Thompson, weren't they? They were from Thompson. That's right. Up in the north corner. Thank you very much. So they were up our way. Um, so I can say that I didn't have contact with anyone in that area. I don't know if my peers had that. Um, well, can I, can I just say, um, in, in Preston, they're between the two casinos and they're also not far from Mystic and their experience is that all of a sudden there'd be these short-term rentals in a, a residential neighborhood and there might be parties or people making noise or events. Um, and I, and I, I think from my perspective, that was one of the things I thought we should regulate um, uh, to protect our, our neighborhoods, which is what Preston was looking to do. Now in, in areas where they've already got mostly short-term rentals, you know, they've already lost their neighborhood there's there's not people there that um that are going to care about it year round. I don't know if that answers your question, Richard. Well, I, I you know, it, this hadn't occurred to me when we were talking about this, you know, months ago. But uh, there are many many rentals down on the shore, and. I, I I think of Lyme and Old Lyme in particular. They have associations down there that uh, that basically uh, self police some of these things, uh, and and I think we would learn a lot by looking at what those neighborhoods are doing. Uh, yes, we're you know kind of locked into the 
the lakes, which are unique to us. But this has been going on for decades down yeah. on on the the Connecticut shore, and 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 the Rhode Island shore too, uh, where we rented for I don't know three four years at a house uh, in Matunic, and uh, uh, in, in the area that we rented in, there was someone that lived on one side of us. That it was their retirement home, and they did not rent it. And on the other side, it was another another rental. Uh, so I, I think we'd do much better looking at some of what the long-term experience has been with those. And then I, I echo the comment that was made by, uh, I think it was Tom, enforcement. Uh, Planet Zoning is not an enforcement organization. Uh, it, we write regulations but I don't think we're really in the mode of day-to-day -day enforcement of those regulations. So I think we really have to think that uh, if we do go these routes, there has to be some sort of a, a mechanism put in place to enforce them. And, and they've got to stand the test of some of the uh, legal uh, challenges that I think are on the horizon. Thank you, Richard. Mark, do you have your hand up? I do. Um, many of these coastal towns and, and, and towns that have vacation rentals years ago changed their zoning so that cert certain streets in town allow for short-term rental. And that's not just Connecticut, that's nationally. I mean, the same thing occurs down in South Carolina in Myrtle Beach, where I own. Liter literally, the, the block that I'm on allows for short-term rental rentals and literally two houses away from my house for the next three blocks does not allow short-term rentals it's you know it's it's a zone they have zoning maps where allow short-term rentals in certain areas and not in other areas long <clears throat> bef long before you know the you know vacation by owner rentals popped up on the internet i mean you know it's been long-standing zoning regs where where we don't have that in Ashford because we've never been faced with it because we're, we're, you know, we're not a vacation destination like coastal properties have been. So, so I, I don't see that we're anywhere similar, you know, to these coastal properties that have, you know, addressed it in their zoning regs. I think I, I, I understand your point. I just thinking that there's some degrees to that. I mean, obviously, you know, we do have the lake districts and everybody loves a body of water and that's where they're drawn to, um, not to the scale of a Myrtle Beach, not to the scale of a, as you said, a destination location. Right. Um, but we are finding that, you know, people are using this as either a, um, a source of income or a source to offset their current mortgage. I mean, right. whatever it is. No, I, and I agree. And I think our approach is correct in addressing short-term rentals. I don't think we want to rezone our lake districts, allowing short-term rentals throughout, which, which is what happens in beach communities. There's certain zones in beach communities. It's allowed. There's, there's no special permitting. It's, it's allowed in that zone, just like also, if you were a commercial zone. I also think what we all what we've heard both at the meeting and I heard in speaking with Ken Slater is limitations, you know, in some way limiting the number either of uh, permits per year, uh, again, permits per location, permits per, um, you know, some quantity that is allowed or not allowed, um, which is does take place in different communities Correct. Uh, to try and limit this. Yeah. And in. And, and... I'm most familiar with uh, Matunic in Rhode Island. <clears throat> and the house that was next door to the house that we rented uh, was probably a $2 million property. And we knew the people that lived there. They didn't rent it out. It was their retirement community. They uh, let some of their friends come and stay from time to time. But uh, as I looked around, because I walked the neighborhood, back then and there were a number of places that were short-term rentals and they weren't zoned uh, block by block uh, mark they were kind of all mixed together so uh, it, i think that was more typical of what uh, 
we might see in, in Ashford. To, but, but are you sure they weren't zoned block by block? Because the same thing happens in Myrtle Beach where you have a multi-million dollar house that's a second home for someone and right next door is a multi-million dollar house that's short-term rental because that entire section, it's allowed. You, you don't have to short-term rental your property, but you're still in that zone. Just like I don't short-term rent my property, but I'm in a short-term rental zone. Yeah, I, I I wasn't researching it at the time because I was simply interested in renting the place for a couple of weeks right. with the family. But uh, I, I do know that the, the, it was all in the same street. And the people that uh, we rented from uh, occupied the home for some number of weeks. Uh, but the bulk of the time, they rented it out to people. So I've, I've, I've just offered that up as as an example to look at because uh, I don't, and I, I don't know if there was a homeowners association. I suspect that there probably was because there was a lot of uh, community property maintenance going on because the uh, people would come in the whole area and mow the lawns all at once uh, and they would do uh, road maintenance. And so, I mean, all I'm saying is that uh, it might behoove us as we look at the regulations to expand what we look at a bit from just lake districts to other areas, uh, you know, and, and then I will echo whatever we come up with, planning and zoning is, is not in a position to be the enforcement mechanism. So if we do this and there's an enforcement, like some of the things that Jeff laid out there, I think there would have to be an entire new organization within the town or the Lake Districts put in place charged with the enforcement. It's just like we have the building inspector charged with enforcement of the, of the building codes. Thank you, Richard. Janet. Oh, um, thank you. I, I just wanted to point out that um, when Mark and I were looking at short-term rentals, uh, I can't remember how many years ago that was. Was that four years ago or so? Um, yeah. yeah, you started at that. Yeah, about four years ago. We we did look at short we we did look at shoreline uh, towns. Obviously, not everyone, and we did tr try to look at towns that had lakes. And at that time, um, there were not short-term rental regs in in their planning and zoning regs um but it it wouldn't hurt to look at them again and i just wanted to reiterate um uh which we've talked about before that the um the lake associations um ha have a difficulty because the um at least ashford and i i believe lake chafee our uh, covenant is in our deeds so they can't really change the covenant without changing everyone's deeds. So Ashford Lake has, has adopted recommendations on short-term rentals, but they, they can't put in a um, uh, any kind of strong regulation. Uh, it would really rely on the town to do that. But I would ask, why should the town do it if there already is a... Lake Association in both Lake Chafee and Ashford Lake, wouldn't it fall on them to establish the regulations? Well, if we change our covenant, we have to go in and change everybody's deeds, and that is just too expensive to do. So um, it, it, there's a, a problem with with um, making a, a regulation in in the at least at Ashford Lake. So how does the Ashford Planning and Zoning Commission somehow solve that problem? Well, I think <laughs> I think it's it's uh, we're Ashford residents, by the way, and um, I think it could be a, a, an issue anywhere in town um, uh, with people people by houses and rent them out for sports events, you know, um, because they can make so much money for it. So I, I think it's, it's could, 
could apply to any neighborhood in, in town. I have a friend who lives in the middle of nowhere in Hampton, and she has an Airbnb and allows dogs. She has a dog bed and all set up for dogs. She gets a lot of business because of that. So anybody can set up an Airbnb and, and end up with um, with with uh, rentals next door to you. Mm -hmm. One of the other pieces, and we're still open for discussion, obviously. One of the other pieces, Mike, can I share? Should be able to still share. Okay. <clears throat> um, one of the other pieces I just wanted to show because we've been referencing referencing it. I was able to grab the um, Preston zoning regulations and just for uh, short term rentals, and I just hit upon some of the areas that um, I think are somewhat pertinent to maybe, you know, I'm not saying that they have the be all and end all, but they do have some very developed ones. And I like the fact that I, I keep beating this horse. I'm sorry. Um, the compliance up front uh, with groups to get them to toe the line, get them to be in line to start with. And if they fall out, it's easier. You know, maybe we've uh, called the herd. Maybe we've reduced down those people who fall out and who we have to regulate or enforce or find compliant. Um, so in this one, I just hit some of the high points under the, uh, uh, you know, it talks about the maximum stay of three weeks and, you know, uh, but it doesn't have any time for a uh, number of rentals as we do in ours, as Mark pointed out. Um, the septic system uh, by the public health code, the uh, Uncas Health District, um, 24 hour contact person available, again, very similar to what we have uh, inspection by the fire marshal and building code. Um, no outdoor events. Um, I can't remember in ours if we have that statement in ours. That was in a number of groups that I've looked at with their uh, um, uh, regulations. Uh, noise level, meeting the state uh, of Connecticut uh, noise control requirements. Uh, the guest register, which is something we mentioned before. When you get into some of the procedures and requirements for the permitting, they want six copies of the floor plan, six copies of the septic system. Um, as Janet said, testing of the well water. Um, and uh, this is this is an interesting extra piece, which is just probably another piece of paper for us to try and deal with, is a notarized letter signed by the owner applicant of the property providing the provided with the application stating the following. So they're basically notarizing and saying that they will be in compliance with all of these uh, requirements, no on-street parking, no outdoor events, um, any non-compliant issue will be addressed immediately. Um, and uh, at the annual review, uh, you know, you can have a statement of who's ever responded to an issue, whether it's the zoning enforcement officer or state trooper or uh, anyone so enforced to do so. Um, the annual renewal permits, uh, and, uh, in this case, the annual renewal in Preston is only a hundred. I think it was two, whatever Mark said, 260 with the initial and then 100 for the renewal. Uh, you have to have it in by August 1st so that there's no question about your intent. And I believe they actually stated that when Janet talked about the three strikes, you're out, um, two of the issues for this one group that got three strikes was that they were late in getting their uh, permit request in. Um, and that became a strike against them and they somehow they did it again. Uh, and mm -hmm. so they got two strikes on that. Um, interesting piece, and this is what Mark brought up about the, the CEO will verify with the assessor that the applicant has filed the annual commercial property income and expense report with the Preston assessor. Um, and also that the uh, a uh, copy of the guest register for renewal and consideration by the CEO in accordance with the section of this. Um, the uh, the guest register, um, it can be looked at any time during the CEO, which allows us to you know look at if there's a complaint or something like that. They can provide us with the guest register uh, as documentation. Again, is it the fox? Uh, covering the hen house with what they're providing from us. But ideally, you like to think that people are honest. And if they're towing the line for all of these requirements, 
they will provide you with an accurate uh, register, not something that they just made up. Um, and applications are not transferable. Um, which is something we have in our regs too, but I'm a little shaky on that. And I don't know if Mike can provide anything along those lines because I believe per zoning, and I think I tried to verify this with Ken, is that the permitted, uh, the special permitting goes with the land. Is that correct, Mike? Is that what you guys told me the other day? Yeah, so um, only a court can actually revoke a permit, a land use approval, like a special permit. However, what we've done to address that is, you may recall what the most recent approval is that I recommended the commission adopt a condition that says that the app, the uh, permit shall be willfully terminated upon sale of the property. And so that um, essentially you can't you can't revoke it, but if you put something like that as a condition of approval and an applicant doesn't essentially appeal the condition, appeal that approval, then it does stand. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Jeff, I've not done research on this thing specifically, but as we sit here and talk, uh, several things come to mind. Uh, I believe there's at least one farm that uh, will host weddings and also has, uh, you know, uh, guest houses on the property that are available for short-term rental. Uh, and I think there's at least one, there may be more than that, but uh, I, I don't believe they're on a lake or they're anything like that, but they're still doing something similar to what we're talking about. Now, I'm just looking at it. Does that fall under temporary agricultural related uses? Yeah, well, they, they host the wedding. So they get, they, they're using the facility for, you know, external event. But they've also got uh, several uh, guest facilities that are open for, you know, short term rental be it one, two, three days because of the people going to the wedding and the bridal party going to the wedding. So it, 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 my, my, my point of bringing this up is that as we start to try to regulate this, there's all sorts of ways this thing can manifest itself. It's not just the uh, properties on the lakes. As, as Janet pointed out, it could be a doggy heaven place. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm not saying that we're going to necessarily be able to, I mean, we don't, we're not able to do it now with our regs that you can't catch someone, you know, trying to find a loophole or slip through a loophole. But if we can put something together that um, up front requires compliance and dissuades from those people <laughs> who think it's a fast buck or a fast way to get around, um, I don't know, 25%, 50%, 70% of our work is done at that point. And, you know, we've got someone who's meeting the rules and the regulations and is not going to fall uh, to the dark side. Um, so, uh, again, I put it out there. Um, you know, one of the things I had in uh, uh, the presentation had to do with this uh, additional compliance and I'm trying to think, and I didn't write it up the best. I just put a few thoughts down. Um, uh, what's what's the group's feeling on uh, uh, initial compliance as opposed to forced compliance after the fact? I, I, Jeff, I don't understand that question. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I if I put a, a funny label on it. What I was talking about was things like requiring the inspections that we had, um, requiring uh, just, again, more upfront in the permitting process of our um, regulations in order to, uh, again, I don't, well, I don't want to use the word hope, but to gain compliance early on, expect compliance, and then if someone 
you know, doesn't meet the regs or something like that. One, it's fewer um, uh, enforcement actions that we need to look into. And hopefully uh, it's given us an opportunity to, again, weed out those groups that might or might not meet compliance farther down the road. Mark. Well, that's where I liked Preston with their application process. I mean, it was a very detailed application and it literally outlined the regulations in the application, what the expectations were, what the results were for non-compliance. Um, you know, in fact, in the application, it's, you know, it states if there's, you know, if there's a complaint that the CEO or the resident trooper, you know, has the right to inspect the property, you know, with 24 hours notice. And if it's something that's urgent, they can inspect it, you know, on the spot you know, if necessary. So, so I like, I like the detail of, you know, the Preston's application process, um, you know, and I keep in the last year, you know, one thing that's come out in all our public hearings is, you know, to maintain the rural nature of Ashford. Well, I, I think if we start having investors purchasing properties in Ashford and, and turning those into, short-term rentals um that that's that certainly doesn't bode well for the the rural nature and character of our town so I, I think it's something that we need to regulate and you know just based on the feedback from town residents I, you know it, it's not just commercial development um you know it, it's residential property use i think na nationally groups are are buying up lots and lots of residential homes. You know, there's an outfit in Canada right now that owns 30,000 homes, you know, in the United States. And they're, and it's not a one-off. There's, there's many of these groups. Um, so okay. Thank anyways, you. Yep. Thanks. Janet. Uh, yeah. And just to say what Mark said, you know, I get a postcard almost every month was somebody wants to buy my house for cash. Um, I agree with Mark that I think the permit process would be a good idea. And a lot of those questions really apply to safety. And, you know, I, I was thinking in the past, people show us, you know, the uh, blueprint of their house, the floor plan of their house, but we're not really qualified to say if there's a problem there that, you know, the fire marshal might say, um, so I, I think it's a really good idea. And also having the um, uh, guest register is a good idea. We we did talk, I think last time, about perhaps asking the homeowner to show us either their tax re receipt or um, their information from the rental company to determine how many rentals they had. Um, but I did want to point out that the attorney the other night did say that if you if you regulate too highly, uh, all these people will go underground and just ignore you and, and, you know, rent on the side. So, you know, we have to, I think, have to have a fine line of, of not over regulating, but but having good regulation. <clears throat> Overregulate us. <laughs> okay. Um, Nord, any feedback from you? Nope. I think it's been said. Okay. Uh, any other feedback from the commissioners? Oh, uh, Jeff. Yes, Jerry. Um, uh, item C on that you have about uh the homes to safety inspection. That uh, before we uh, allow a, a Airbnb, uh, <clears throat> the safety of the house. Yes. Especially uh, a house that has a second floor where a bedroom is upstairs. There's maybe a, one stairway down and there's no access to get out a window because the window is too high or doesn't open. <clears throat> uh it's a fire hazard in my book, but uh, 
because I've been in a couple houses uh, and the upstairs bedroom, the window was uh, up so high and so small that uh, I couldn't get out it if there was a fire. Yep. And so what does a small child or, or a small woman or a small guy, whatever, to uh, be able to get out of the house if they're upstairs and there's a fire? That, that's why that's why I'm you know I, I do have a concern about uh, the safety and the uh, um, you know the safety requirements of someone and responsibility of someone renting a place multiple times to various people and making sure that that place is up to speed up to code for again heaven forbid something should happen um, and you know um, proper, proper inspection proper guidance wasn't put in place mm -hmm. I've, I've piped up a couple of times uh, jeff two or three points uh, talking about eastern highlands doing an inspection basically the in, uh, regulation of eastern highlands is they look at the number of bedrooms and they look at the sizing of the septic system to meet the number of bedrooms. That's all they do. They don't go in and inspect the septic system or require inspection of the septic system. So I don't think that's a viable thing. Uh, when we talk about safety of a rental property, what about the safety of all properties in general? Uh, you know, when a house is built, uh, it must conform to building codes, but lots of times houses are built, you know, a hundred years ago and they weren't inspected at that time. So, you know, how is a rental property different from ones that are not rented? Should we require inspection of existing properties? So it's, I bring these things up because it's a lot of this is like slippery slopes as we look at rental properties and treating them different from other properties that, that we supposedly all already regulate. Well, the thing is, when it, at least in my estimation, I mean, obviously we can take this up with uh, Ken Slater and speak with him more on it. But in my estimation, well, okay, so yeah, so yeah, some of those houses were built 100 years ago. But guess what? You're not renting an Airbnb to someone that a house that hasn't been changed in 100 years. I mean, people have made improvements, people have made changes, people have put up walls, put up rooms and things like this that have changed that house. And again, I think there is a responsibility of a, well, an applicant in this case, but a rent, uh, a rental owner to the people that are renting there to be sure that it's up to speed. Mark, you were going to say something. I was, I was just going to fall back to the, the Preston regulations and in the short you know, even though, you know, Dick, the person, you know, has owned the house for 20 years, it was, or let's say 40 years, it was, and let's say there were hardly any regulations 40 years ago. And the short term rental, you know, part of the regulation is the structure has to be inspected by the town building inspector and fire marshal, and it has to meet all current building and fire code. So regardless of what the regulations were at the time the house was built, if you're going to do a short-term rental, it has to meet current regulations. You know, that that is a, a section we do not have in our short-term short rentals right now that I think we should probably add because that would allow the town to inspect to make sure there isn't a fire hazard, to make sure there isn't a safety hazard before the PNZ you know, approves the permit. Yeah, and, and just to be the devil's advocate here, uh, when a house is sold, should we require similar kinds of inspections when a but house that, is sold? But, that, but this is part of the short-term rental regulations. I, I know, but it's, it, it's a slippery slope, as we said, about to try to do these things and i, I don't think i don't see it as a slippery soap I, I see it as a different area altogether this is specific okay. to short-term rentals okay 
use. If I, someone I, doesn't, simply... if someone doesn't use it for short-term rentals, it doesn't mean that they have to have their house meet current building and fire codes. But if they do, now now they're now they're opening themselves up to making sure that their structure does meet code. And if they go underground, you know, the reality is, I would suspect in a litigation, you know, if, if something bad were to happen that, you know, the the opposing attorney is, is, is certainly going to crucify them for, you know, not getting a permit, their house doesn't meet regulations. Um, I, I, I don't think I'd want to be their insurance company. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, I, I would think that, by the way, if uh, I were the insurance company and I spent quite a few years in the insurance business, I, I would think that a, a, a question which I think exists on the uh, insurance application is, do you, you know, rent out this property? And that that automatically, from the insurance company's viewpoint, triggers a whole bunch of things. So, you know, I I think we we, we need to to put forth regulations, but I think we need to understand how all this fits together with existing things as they are going on right now. You know, uh, uh, I, I'm not against us putting forth regulations, but I, I, I think that we need to look at what is uh, reasonable and what's enforceable and what we can and can't do. And, and keep in mind that we write regulations, we do not enforce regulations. Well, we do and we don't. I mean, obviously we have the zoning enforcement officer that has certain enforceable uh, responsibilities and actions. Uh, whether it's a cease and desist, whether it's a stop work. Um, I mean, we and we have lawyers that are able to write these letters too to stop someone who's breaking a regulation. So we, I, we know we're not necessarily running out and running up under their doorstep and banging on the door and saying, stop, stop, stop. But I mean, we do have enforceable actions that we can do, yeah, whether and, it's litigious or otherwise. And, and I'll put one last thing and then I'll stop my comments. Uh, Mansfield has uh, a significant uh, seasonal rental with all the students, and they ended up putting in place a special office that goes around and enforces all their regulations on the student rentals. So uh, it it can be done, but it requires a uh, infrastructure to enforce these things. And I don't think the zoning enforcement officer by himself is going to be able to enforce all these things. Mike, well, are you, do, do, do you agree or disagree with me? I think that a lot of the things that present problems with short-term rentals go beyond the scope of what uh, anybody in a zoning enforcement capacity or or even other town agencies can really enforce. Um, it's a monitoring issue and a lot of these things happen when when government isn't working. Um, but uh, I also think that looking to other agencies to 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 verify compliance of a structure is, I, I didn't go to that meeting, but for Preston's regulations, I'd be interested to know how they were implemented because in, in the zoning side of the house, we do, we choose what our regulations say, but for building and fire, the state has a code which says you shall do this and shall not do that. So for example, fire marshal only has jurisdiction on three family units or greater. So he could not inspect a single family home because he doesn't have the jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. My understanding of the building code is that they have jurisdiction over work that they have permitted through the building permit process. So they couldn't go into an existing house and say X, Y, and Z is wrong because they would have to look at when the work was done and determine what the code at that time said. So they couldn't look at the method of egress 
and say this doesn't comply because when it was constructed, it may very well have complied. Um, I don't think a building official can legally go into an existing home and make a determination on code compliance. So perhaps the fact that there's a short-term rental going on there changes that, but um, I, that that's something that I've got to look into a little bit more. Yeah, Mike, are you familiar with what Mansfield does with the yes. student housing uh, rentals? Yes, yep. And it, there's a separate office that monitors and enforces that. Yeah, they have a housing division, and that is for rentals that occur based upon when they were, based upon when the rentals began in the, the structure. It's, I think, there's a three-bedroom capacity, or they, they establish a capacity, but that is for um, legitimately student housing type of facility. So multiple unrelated individuals living in the same house, sharing a kitchen, but it's different than what we're dealing with here because it's it's not aligned with a single family use in the same way that a short-term rental would. Yeah, it, it, it it's not the same, but it, the fact is that they had to put in place a organization to enforce it. Okay, very good. I know we've got another uh, item to discuss and the Huskies are calling, um, but I did just want to touch upon a few things here. Thank you for this great discussion. Um, uh, we'll take in any type of input. I encourage people to uh, do some research, to look around. Uh, if you know of a town or a friend or a family who has activity along this line, uh, we'll take it as input and we'll move forward. Um, I'll try and work with Mike and uh, draft a few things after Mike has told me I'm all wet for people going in to inspect stuff to see if that's really the case. Um, but what I did want to do bring up here was there were a few proposed legislations that we got in a flyer from the uh, Connecticut Federation of Planning and Zoning Agencies that are pertinent. Um, I'll just touch upon these briefly, um, do my best so that Valerie can capture what is uh, being said. One is SB, uh, Senate Bill number 335, uh, regarding short-term rental properties. Um, this proposed law would vest the authority to regulate short-term rentals with the legislative body of a municipality. While this direct authority to regulate this activity is appreciated, the law raises the issue whether such an ordinance would impair the authority of zoning commission to regulate short-term rentals. I say, let them have it, um, <laughs> but that's out there. Um, conversion of commercial real estate residential. This is SB number 416. Um, it would simply uh, require zoning regulations to permit the conversion or partial conversion of a commercial building to residential use. Um, there's another requirements and things in there and no public hearing uh, on the application would be allowed. So that's being, that's a proposed legislation. Um, there's training for inland wetlands. I won't get into that one. Um, HB number 5173, online publication of legal notices. This bill would permit municipal agencies, whenever they are required by law to advertise a legal notice in a newspaper, to instead post the notice on the municipal website. All other notice publication publishing requirements would remain the same, such as the number and timing of the invoices. That would be significant uh, savings. I hope the newspaper lobby is not as strong as it used to be. Um, uh, expiration date of certain land use approvals, HB number 5272, um, really has to do with uh, uh, expiration dates for site plans, subdivisions, and special permits um, with uh, certain time frames. Uh, I think it's 14 years is what they're talking, plus a possible extension of five years. So that's something that's on the horizon. And... Uh, uh, also, there's a plan here. It really doesn't apply to us. It's HB 5391, establishing a housing density rating program. But this really has to do with larger municipalities that uh, have a public water service and sewer, uh, limited lot size of uh, 7,500 square feet, accessory apartments, all of this. What it does is give them a point basis that might allow them to basically be exempt from the Affordable Housing Appeals Act if they 
uh, have met these requirements and they gain a certain number of points. So I'm sure it's much more involved than what I just explained, but that's also on the horizon. So those are just a few things that I wanted to touch upon. I thought some of them, at least a couple of them were uh, near and dear to our hearts uh, regarding planning and zoning in Ashford. Okay, uh, going on to the uh, discussion of the IID zone. Uh, mm -hmm. This in itself, obviously we got a lot of input uh, from a couple of the uh, letters. We do need to make, uh, I'm looking for input from the commission, how the commission feels, what they feel is in the best interest, what they've heard so far. Again, it's not a hearing, it's a discussion on uh, moving forward with uh, either the making or the not making of amendment changes to the IID zone. Uh, and whether it is prior to or in conjunction with the POCD, obviously in conjunction with the POCD would be best. But uh, again, looking for any input you wish to share regarding the IID zone and what you've heard um, uh, from uh, both a matter of uh, economic development as well as uh, conservation and uh, rural character. Janet. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Now, Christina Sebo mentioned the uh, CLEAR program, and I, I believe she meant what it, it's called the parcel prior, prior, to, prior tourization source water tool that CLEAR has developed. And um, Charlie Vidic um, brought it to our attention in November. And it um, you, you put in all the inputs of the uh, of the land um, and it gives you suggestions of what would be um, safe to build on. Um, Luther had asked that we uh, run it without concern to bedrock. And um, I thought Mike was going to um, to run that program. Um, it was run for the site um, by Clear, I guess, and um, people should have the copy of that information. And it seems to me that that would be a good starting point for looking at how to regulate the property. I think we should regulate it based on the the quality of the land and, and the water and um, how to protect that. Um, and then we'll move on from that rather than um, move from a point of what we want to put there and, and make it fit. I'll ask Mike. Mike, do you have a recollection of this? Hold on, Lord. Uh, do you have a recollection of moving forward with this with CLEAR? I remember it being discussed during the meeting, and but I apologize, I, I do not remember that as a homework item for me. So if it was, um, that is my blunder, and, and I will I will take a look at it. I, I've got all the documentation. Remember we discussed it. I just I didn't uh, didn't realize that I was um, holding everything up. So I will look at that. Okay, you get a U for uns. Uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Um, very good, uh, Nord. Uh, I want to say uh, something about change. Change is something that's going to happen. But as members of the planning and zoning, we want that change to go in a direction that we want it to go in that's beneficial to the town. When we crafted the restrictions on the IID zone, before any of this hullabaloo happened, we spent a lot of time considering all the different factors that could happen. And so far, those restrictions have been working in our favor. There, the, the, any development that happens in that area will, will have to adhere to those regulations. So I think that uh, those regulations need very little change, if any. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Nori.
Uh, um, Jeff, I keep put, putting up my hand and it keeps on getting shut off. Okay, uh, go ahead, Richard. I didn't see it down there. Go ahead. Uh, we have the current regulations in existence for uh, Exit 72, uh, IID, whatever we want to call it. Uh, I, I would ask that we formally request legal opinion that if we were to implement some of the changes that were put forth by the Conservation Commission and the other parties that are recommending changes, uh, what I implication would that have to the liability of the town for the owner of that property that bought the property and owns the property with those uh, uh, zoning uh, requirements in place? Uh, I'm not saying changing them, just leaving them alone as they have. Because if you read some of the uh, recommendations that came from the things that were submitted recently, th they're saying basically go back and revisit everything and and don't and and don't allow any development there. Uh, and I would think that the owner would have some <clears throat> sort of recourse on that. And I'd like to see that our legal counsel weighs in on that. I, I can make a formal motion to that effect if you'd like. No, no, we don't. I don't think we need a formal motion on that. We'd be happy to move forward and talk with Ken. Obviously, the more input we get from Ken, the better. Um, and, you know, to my end, one of the things in the, with the Conservation Commission and the letter, the uh, report from the, uh, excuse me, I want to get their name right. The, uh, do, do, do. The Eastern Connecticut Conservation uh, District. Um, whereas, you know, it is, it is a, 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 I feel a long and complete report. Um, I don't think it says the sky is falling. I think it simply says that we need to be thoughtful in uh, considering any type of development um, in the area that's being identified, uh, especially in regards to um, the watershed and the water supply. But um, as long as certain requirements are met, such as the recommendations to the 2002 Soil and Erosion Control Manual, as well as the 2011 Low Impact Development Appendix, um, you know, both of those guidance documents uh, don't preclude activity in that area, development in that area. It just simply uh, needs to be uh, thoughtful and falling around those standards when it comes to uh, concerns for the watershed and the water supply in there, uh, yeah. especially. Um, and Jeff, I, I would point out again to one of the things we put in the regulation, if someone proposes a large development anywhere in town, Exit 72 or wherever, if it uh, is a large development, they're required to put up uh, a certain percentage of the cost of that development or $15,000, which, whichever is greater. And that money can be used to hire consultants that would look at this from the town's perspective. So we have built into our regulation the ability to, to vet any proposal that would be made, be it at exit 72, be it uh, at the water, the wagon shed properties, be it uh, at farmland, who knows where in the town. If, if anyone proposes something large in the town, we have the ability to levy a fee on them that would allow us to hire consultants that could do the environmental uh, and land use regulation uh, due diligence on behalf of the town. Sure, and I and I am well aware. And thank you, Dick, uh, for you know reminding us of that. Um, I guess. I guess part of the concern uh, is, you know, where in the process that would be. I mean, ideally not uh, once a site plan had been put on our um, 
tables or our desk in front of us, but potentially, um, you know, what we can have in place. And, you know, to the ends to respond to the uh, uh, Conservation Commission, as well as the Ashford Citizen letter that we read into the record tonight, um, you know, I, I think it would behoove us to gain some perspective, maybe from our own legal counsel, as to the adequacy of our uh, special permitting process. Uh, or is there something we need to look at? Again, it's been a number of years. Uh, things change quickly. Um, do we need to update that, uh, whether it's, you know, seeking out uh, or, or at least showing a process for seeking out input from uh, whether it's NECOG engineers or uh, commercially paid engineers to uh, update us and what exactly we need to look at along those lines? Yeah, um, I, I don't have the thing, the uh, language in front of me, but I did help write it at the time. Uh, but it basically says upon the special permit being submitted that this these monies need to be submitted at that point in time. Right, right, and put into the escrow and such like that. Yes, yep. absolutely. Janet. So um, I have some um, concerns about the special permitting process. Um, uh, first of all, if if we if we rely on that, like like Jeff said, the the uh, developer has all these site plans and develops everything, and then all of a sudden we ask for these um, reviews that maybe they didn't know about, and and so they put all this money in it. I think you're better off having more of the regulations written down so that any developer can can see what we're going to ask. Um, I think the low impact development checklist is certainly a good place to start. And I guess if if you so if you ask somebody to do an environmental study or I guess it's it's too it's too um, what am I going to say it's it's not defined enough um, uh, uh, as to what you're going to ask people in your special permit process, I think, ultimately. Yeah, Janet, you know, the, the issue isn't that it's defined. In applying for the special permit, uh, there are a number of issues that come up, and you can list them in terms of the general categories. And these funds that are escrowed for the town to spend on consultants would be to do the studies that would refute or debate or contest what was being proposed. So if someone's proposing to build uh, a large scale development that would require, uh, you know, immense septic systems to be built, the town would have monies to look at that and say, is that feasible or not? So it, it, it it's not like all the items have to be specified ahead of time. It's just that the town could use those monies to look at all those items. Uh, the same kind of thing that comes forth and what we wrote this in the beginning, there was a proposal to build a waste recycling facility at exit 72. And we wanted to make sure that they couldn't just do that open loop. We wanted to have the ability for them to put forth the funds for the town to look at that waste recycling facility and make sure that it, it would be done in a way that would not harm the environment. You know, so um, uh, it, it doesn't have to be spelled out lockstep. It just allows the town to use those funds to refute What's being proposed? Well, and and thank you, Dick. And, but to that end, you know, with what Janet was saying, my thought process has to deal with. Uh, I'm not too proud to say I don't know what I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to uh, some type of large scale um, uh, permit, special permit application coming out, and all these experts throwing all these things at us, and 
what I should be refuting, what I should not be refuting. And if we have, um, you know, if we do have some items laid out specifically, making our regs more robust uh, and requirements for people to provide us information um, up front, you know, according to uh, very similar to what Janet was saying, I think we'll get better information and uh, have some basis for making our request or our decision for more for more information from the applicant. Uh, again, as I said, um, I don't know what I don't know many times. And uh, so I wouldn't know what to ask uh, of them. Whereas if I do have some type of a, whether it's a checklist or whether it's a, you know, something provided from a third party resource, then we can use that as a guide uh, to allow us to get better information from an applicant. My only comment, Jeff, is we don't know what's going to be proposed. We've we were faced with a recycling facility at Exit Seventy Two. We could also be faced with a digester facility at Exit Seventy Two. We were faced with the potential for a wind farm at Exit 72. There's been a lot of things that have been proposed, and the items that one would look at for each of those are different. So to be able to, to put forth the checklist is difficult. But if we have the ability to look at this and look at the impact in the general sense, I think we're better protected. Uh, you know, I obviously, I, I absolutely do not want to see some adverse things going into Exit 72. Uh, and the potential for those things being proposed there, uh, based on past history, are pretty high. So we want to have the funds to hire consultants that will represent the town in our best interest to refute whatever is going on. And a, a, a lot of the citing potentially could be driven by the state. And uh, to, to go back against the, what the state wants to do is another issue. Uh, so, you know, we can come up with... If you come there's, a lot, with there's a lot of what ifs in those statements, though, Dick. I mean, the thing is, uh, you know, I'm I think it would behoove us overall to make some of the, especially with what's important to the town, besides the rural character, if you will, and I don't mean to roll my eyes in any way. Um, it's really, you know, the, um, the, the the watershed areas, the, uh, you know, the, the quality and the uh, making sure that we're not contaminating any type of areas where we go in, because we do have a very vast hydrological system under ashford and um you know a, a few well-placed um studies or checklists added to our regs that are recommended from many of the groups that we look to for resources and input um i think just you know it strengthens our regs and makes us um a more formidable group when it comes to an applicant coming in and you know, not not drowning us in expertise, but giving us again, giving us that solid footing to be able to offer up um, a uh, opposing viewpoint on some items. I, I would be uh, amenable towards putting forth a list of items that should be included, but put the caveat that it is not inclusive. Because right, they're right, not limited to right. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, because there could be a lot of things we don't even know about. You know, sure, sure. But there are a couple of areas I think we can use some uh, some resources. Janet, oh, I was just going to uh, say to uh, to Dick that um, it, it's not an either or situation. We we would still have a special permitting uh, ability. So um, if something strange or unusual or obnoxious came up we, we we would still have the ability to um to use that process at least in my opinion 
We've had a number of people that, uh, um, you know, giving input along these lines. I'd like to, um, uh, I, I, you know, not to put people on the spot, um, Tom or Jeff or Steve, um, but is there, or for that matter, no, we didn't have Dollar. Thank you. Um, is is there any input, uh, any feelings along the uh, uh, IID zone uh, that you want to share? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Steve. I wasn't. I wasn't reaching out to you. I was reaching out to Steve Pesh, my. Oh, mission. okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, though. I'm still here listening. Yes, thank you. Um. I, hey, thanks, Jeff. I've been listening for a little bit here. Um. I don't have anything to add at this time. I think it's really important. Somebody, an hour and forty five minutes ago. Um, <laughs> oh, you're keeping time? Come on. Yeah, well, what's the, you know, you have what nine minutes till. Um, <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> um, somebody said, um, "Yes, we've allocated. We've set aside that funds should be allocated for studies. But what do we do with the results of those studies?" And I think that's where I would leave it. Um, that if you want to have some outside expert opinion on what can be done on the landscape within the IID, then we need to formally assign what monies would be, how monies would be used to ask particular specific questions about those uh, areas within the, the town. Yeah. Steve, I would ask you to read the regulations because it gives the town significant leeway as to how those funds would be used. And I believe it's a um, it's a one percent or fifty five zero thousand um, dollars, depending on which is uh, applicable based on the size of the uh, uh, structure and facility that is being proposed. So uh, it's it's some hefty monies that are in there. So people would be uh, vested um, should they come forth with a proposal looking for some type of permit or special permit along these lines. Um, and we are looking to exercise them to uh, allow us the monies to make that informed decision to gain expert uh, input. So uh, anyone else? on this. We will have more discussion. Again, I appreciate the input on this. Um, I, I'm also just one one final thing that I offer up is, again, with our regs right now in the IID zone, they are also, I mean, the, the first page is really geared toward agricultural, agricultural this, agricultural that. Is that the remain, does that remain a uh, an identifier? For us, does it remain as the uh, uh, the structure we want to build around? Is it simply uh, based on agriculture and its activity? Which I think, if you take it literally, I think it stymies us a little bit uh, for activity in that zone. Um, though there are permitted uses of retail and motor, you know, motor vehicle repair and things like that. In the first few sentences, it really gears things toward agriculture. And I'm wondering if we uh, are, it behooves us to maintain uh, with that identif identifier. Yeah. Jeff, having written that uh, at the time before your time on the planning and zoning, there was a strong uh, agricultural bent, and we wanted food and fiber and a whole bunch of things. And it was put in every zone lockstep. And if you look in the regulations, the same thing is repeated over and over again. Uh, it was not meant to be the driving force. And what we did, we put it there, but then we added everything else beyond that. But it wasn't meant to be the uh, say all, you know, uh, item from that because you've got to look at the entire 
regulation for that zone, and it includes all the other uses and special permitted uses, not just agriculture. Well, it stands out for me because obviously it doesn't, uh, I don't think food and fiber is identified in the, um, is it identified that way in the residential zone? I, I'm, I don't have the regulations in front of me, Jeff, but uh, I do recall a lot of debate at the time we did this, that there was language that was put in every zone, both the residential, the commercial, and uh, the IID, the uh, I wagon. I do see it here, uh, Dick, in uh, A2. But what it doesn't get into, um, it doesn't get into some of the more specifics when it comes to agriculture, like it does in the uh, uh, IID zone. Uh, you know, there are specific instances in the opening paragraphs there. Again, just food for thought, things to look at here. Mm -hmm. um, if, if, if we if we can develop all the things we've talked about using yeah. agriculture in those zones, I'll, I'll, I'll stand here and uh, heartily raise my hand to endorse it. But uh, I, there's only so many things you can do at Exit 72 uh, unless you start doing, you know, large scale agriculture, uh, hot houses and this kind of things that Luther is, is doing in his property. Right, right. OK, any more discussion on the I2G zone for tonight? No. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Not seeing any here. Um, moving on to the uh, item of new new business. Uh, so, Mike, we have a subdivision application. Yep, it's a just a one lot. Um, so it's submitted and will be before you at your meeting in May. There's no public hearing that's required. So this is just notifying of receipt for the next meeting. Okay, very good. Um, have all fees been paid? Yes. Okay. And the documentation is appropriate? Yeah, I have a hard copies in my office. I'm just getting the digital copies and everything will be posted. Okay, very good. Um, do I have a motion to uh, receive the application for the conversion of agricultural lot to so building moved. lot? Jerry Second. moved. Second. Janet seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All, those, all those opposed? Abstentions? So moved. Uh, moving on to the zoning officer report. Mike, besides a bad back, what do you got? <laughs> um, I, as I mentioned to you, uh, what I'll do is I'm going to try to convert the IID zone regs, the, the site development standards, um, into like a onto a single sheet of paper so that hopefully when this gets discussed at subsequent meetings, it'll be a little bit easier to identify or, or keep tabs on what the regs currently allow. Um, and we're still working and hopefully in the final stages of um, getting things wrapped up with the Lakewoods Lane subdivision. Um, we've had a several meetings, both with Ken, the developer, and others trying to get that project finalized. Um, so I'm hoping, they're they're hoping to pave in May. So we are trying to get the bond rectified with that. Um, had, are we in a good, um, are we in a good spot with that, you think? Or is it still up in the air? Um, we're in a good spot as far as what the path forward is. We just need to kind of come to agreement on the the um, number for the bond. Yep. Um, we're using the minimum pricing as provided by DOT, which is inevitably a little bit different than what your a contractor would, just, you know, potentially get. So we just got to work through the delta between the two and then get a an agreement in place. Um, but uh, I think we'll be in good shape, you know, in the next couple of weeks. Mike, Mike, did did you say 
pave or pay in May? So they will they will do both. They will pay <laughs> in the sense that they will put together a bond. And then once they provide a bond, they will then pave. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, Mike, you said you're going to do a one page of the regulations for the uh, IID. Um, I take it you're not going to rewrite what's already written. No, I just want to basically summarize or boil down the high points of what are the allowed uses, what are the setbacks, what is the height, you know, rather than kind of paging through what's in the regulations now, if people can look at what is currently in place, they can make a determination as to whether or not any of those things need to be adjusted. It just, you know, rather than referring to this section of the regs and what does this say and flipping this page and that page, I think getting it into one spot might make it easier for people to determine if they feel like any of the standards need to be modified. Yeah, Mike, I would ask that uh, uh, before you make that public, that you send it out to the commission for comment. So all I'm going to do is take the existing regulations and put them on a single sheet of paper. There's going to be no proposed edits. It's not going to be any any revisions. It's just going to be what they say now. I guess we'll take take your word at it. I would. <laughs> okay. Uh, anything else, Mike? That's it. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mike. Um, guess what? I'm almost on motion, time. Motion um, I'm adjourn. looking for a uh, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. M motion for you, Con. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry, motion. Janet seconded. All those in favor of adjournment for tonight? Aye. 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 Uh, so moved. I don't hear anything else. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you all for the great discussion. We'll have more of this, obviously, for the uh, next week, or excuse me, next month. And um, again, uh, I thank you for all your hard work and your attention. Have a good night. You, Take Jeff. care. Go, go Huskies. Thanks, Jeff.